dementia researcher with a blog and a rating. The field lit up recently with news that a drug called lecanemab has successfully made it through clinical trials and could be available to patients as early as next year. The drug is an anti-amyloid antibody shown to slow the rate of cognitive decline in early stage Alzheimer's patients by up to 27%. It's the first drug to effectively improve the symptoms of Alzheimer's post-diagnosis and it's a huge step forward and further shows the potential of antibodies as therapeutic tools. The road extensively employed against inflammatory diseases like arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease and as someone who takes a weekly dose of antibody therapy, I can personally attest to their efficacy. The news is, however, an exception to the rule. Alzheimer's drug trials have a 99% failure rate And that goes a long way to explaining why this is only the first breakthrough of its kind after decades of research. It's in part due to the complexity of the disease. It's hard to treat something if you still don't know exactly what's causing it. And we're currently trying to piece together this million piece jigsaw. However, we've been aware of the two most major contributing factors to the disease for many years. Amyloid aggregation and the formation of tau tangles. We've developed a vast array of drug candidates that have shown to be effective in targeting and reversing these mechanisms in the lab. But when they go to clinical trials, they come face to face with their biggest hurdle, a structure called the blood-brain barrier. Despite only accounting for 2% of our total body weight, the brain actually requires about 15-20% to of our blood supply. It's penetrated by a vast network of blood vessels, and they have the important job of providing the cells of the brain with the things they need to function. Those blood vessels also have another important job to do as well. They protect the brain from any blood-borne components that could cause damage to neural cells. This is a function they carry out with help from the blood-brain barrier. In short, it's a selective, semi-permeable border of cells that tightly regulates what goes into and comes out of the brain. It's like passport control for the nervous system. If you aren't supposed to be there, you're not coming in. This makes it really hard to design drugs that can be effective against diseases like dementia. Those drugs aren't meant to be there, so the blood-brain barrier often stops their entry into the brain. They can carry all the dementia-curing potential in the world, but if they can't cross that barrier, they're useless. It's a huge hurdle for drug development, and a particularly tricky one for antibody therapy. Antibodies are quite large on a molecular level, and are generally stumped when it comes to entering through our neural passport control. Even when they can cross, the mechanisms can be a bit crude. Take the controversial Algehelm as an example. It gets into the brain by disrupting the blood-brain barrier. It's effective for getting the drug where it needs to be, but a disruptive blood-brain barrier opens the doors for an array of damaging components to follow it. Fortunately, we've got other options. One promising avenue for exploration is the field of nanomedicine. It involves using compounds that are nanoscale in size, far smaller than any antibody. We're talking about structures that can be 100 to 10,000 times smaller than a human cell. What that essentially means is you've got a better chance of getting a therapy through the blood-brain barrier. It's not a given. Nanomedicines still face some of the same challenges as larger components, but the chemistry can be tailored to greatly increase drug delivery through the barrier and into the brain. But at such a small size, can we actually deliver an effective playload into the brain? The answer is yes. I'm not going to do a literature review here, but we've seen some promising developments regarding a wide variety of therapeutic options. Take, for example, small interfering RNAs or siRNAs, which have demonstrated efficacy for silencing proteins involved in the toxic accumulation of amyloid beta in Alzheimer's disease. And they can be modified with nanocarriers to greatly increase brain delivery. In Parkinson's disease, nanotechnology has shown the potential to improve gene delivery approaches to therapy by helping reduce toxicity and also immunogenicity, i.e. the immune system doesn't attack the drug as much as it normally would. If you pair this with improving the crossing of the blood-brain barrier, again, nanomedicine shows potential for Parkinson's disease. We've also seen the use of nanotechnology to deliver metal ion collators to target a potentially toxic increase of compounds like copper into the brains of Alzheimer's patients. The clinical promise is definitely there, and nanomedicine is being trialled across a variety of therapeutic areas, with 50 therapies currently approved, albeit none for dementia. Still, to paraphrase and mash up the ARUK slogan with that of an old mobile phone company, the future is bright, the future is orange for nanomedicine. 
especially when you see examples of exciting nano-based dementia therapies making it into clinical trials like nanolithium. The drug, which is being trialled for mild to severe Alzheimer's in France, inhibits a key component of amyloid aggregation. The study should be fully complete by early 2024, and I suspect regardless of the outcome of this trial, we will see a lot more like this in coming years. Nanomedicines might be small, but their potential is huge. They're the reaches of the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you for listening. Join the Dementia Research bloggers and share your own views.